good morning, good morning, One City family. Hello, hello. What a beautiful day it is. Hello to our online family as well. I just want to encourage you guys with this scripture from Ephesians, verses 3. It says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and he chose us. So this morning, if you're feeling like nobody notices you, if you feel like your family's not accepting you, that you're not chosen, remember, God chose you from the foundations of the world. All right, thank you guys for coming in today. Let's praise and worship, amen.
we thank you, God, that you loved us before we even loved ourselves, God. That our identity is found in you, God, and that we are who you say we are. So we just thank you, God.
chosen, not forsaken. Some of you might not know this about me, but when I was a, a, a kid, I was, I was adopted as a child. And kids, I don't know if you guys know this, but kids can be kind of mean to other kids sometimes. And I remember when I was a kid and I was at a school and people were like, why don't you look like your mom and dad? I said, well, I'm adopted. And they used to give me the hardest time. And they say things like this. You don't know who your daddy is. You don't have a clue who your daddy is. And that hurt. But I remember going home to my father and saying, Dad, this is what they said to me. And he said, Son, I know how you're feeling right now, but guess what? You're chosen. We chose you to be a part of our family. We went there and we said, We want you. Hey, guys, that's what God says to each and every single one of you. You are chosen. Ephesians 1 5 says you guys are predestined into the to be adopted into sonship that means you guys that means your dad is the king that makes you a prince that makes you princesses so no matter where we are in our life whatever circumstance that we're going through in our life you know who your dad is and he loves you and it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. He doesn't promise for it not to be bumpy. But the reason why you can be content in any circumstance is because your God, your Father, will always, always remain true to you. To make you proud I'll never be more loved than I am right now Going through a storm But I won't go down I hear your voice Carried in the rhythm of the wind To call me out You would cross an ocean
today that we are content in whatever our circumstances are, Lord. Because, Lord, you are more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine, Lord. Lord, you show up in ways that we could never expect. And for that, Lord, I'm so thankful, Lord. You're God who loves. You're God who freely gives. Lord, I just pray today that we grasp just a little bit onto the goodness that you have in store for every single one of us, Lord. So even when we're in those dark valleys, Lord, we remember what you did on the mountaintops. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, as we get ready for Pastor Jared to come for the message here in just a minute, Lord, I, I pray that you prepare our hearts to be attentive to what it is you have in store for us today, Lord. Lord, I pray over his words that they pierce through the hardness that sometimes we put on our hearts, Lord. I pray that you pierce, your word pierces right through those. And you soften our hearts, Lord. Lord, I thank you for every ear under the sound of my voice. I thank you for everybody who's listening online right now, Lord. I just pray that you show up in the way that I know you can show up all the time, Lord. They allow you to enter into their homes in a way that only you can, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In your most precious name I pray. Amen. If you could please turn your attention to the screen. Happy Sunday, church. Come on, y'all can do better than that. Come on, get excited. You know why you need to be excited? Because today we're going to share the word of God. And here's what I just believe someone needs to hear. There is nothing more transformational to your life than the word of God, the truth of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Today we're kicking off something special. And if you've been with One City Church uh, for a while, you know we like to have fun with this. But we launch it usually every single month. And so I want you to help me bring it in. And so on the count of three, let's let everyone know what we're doing today. One, two, three. Brand new series. Come on, give the Lord a hand. Clap. Brand new series today called The Starting Line. The Starting Line. And it, so last week... We finished 21 days of fasting and prayer, and we, we ended that with an incredible night of worship. If you were here, oh man, it was out of this world. The Holy Spirit was so powerful uh, in that service. We baptized 25 people last Sunday. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. People are giving their lives publicly uh, to Jesus. But here's the thing. Sometimes when I come into a spiritual discipline like fasting, one of the things we tend to do is we tell ourselves, I just need to get to the end. I just need to get through these 21 days. And after I get through these 21 days, then I can go right back to the same habits and behaviors that I quit for 21 days. And how many know this? Breaking free from the things that are getting in the way of your relationship from God, with God. That is not the finish line. That is the starting line. That's where things are just beginning. Once I remove what is blocking my relationship with Jesus, I'm now in a position to go on this journey with Christ so that I can experience the life that Jesus designed for me. See, if I go right back to the old habits that I gave up through those 21 days, I'm just walking right back into the life I created for me. I don't know what it is about people, but I think sometimes we set the finish line as the starting line. And I just think that this series, it's not only for us individually, but this series is for us as a church. Because right now we are standing at the starting line of a brand new journey, getting ready to go into a brand new building that is going to become the foundation 
of One City Church bringing change throughout this entire community. And at the end of this series, we're going to be having our annual offering. We call it the kingdom offering, where we bring our very best to God. We release it to him and we say, God, go do the impossible. And if you're new with us, that's not for you. This is our annual offering. It's our most impactful offering. That is for those who call One City Church home. But if you're led to give, man, we are thankful for your generosity. But this year, we believe that this church is going to do the impossible. We believe that one city church is going to show up in a way no one ever thought they would show up. And we're going to expand the kingdom in ways we never dreamed was going to be possible out of this church. And I just need to say this. We need you in this movement. We need you as part of this journey. Man, we were given this building as a miracle. Because a community of people believe in the potential of this church, of one city church, to bring transformational change into the communities, into families, into businesses, and eventually throughout the entire region of Hampton Roads. And so in order for us to accomplish what God's calling us to accomplish, we have a need that we will only meet if we come together as one family and we all make the commitment to give God our very best. Not our almost very best. Can I just say this? Right now, there are far too many churches giving God their almost best. And not enough churches willing to sell out and say, God, here is my very best. Do the miraculous with it. And so this offering is simple. We're going to give God our very best. And then we're going to get out of the way. And we're going to let God do what God does. Amen. Amen. Now, today we also release our annual report. We love that we do that every single year. And so our annual report is right now accessible online uh, underneath About Us on our website. It's also available by texting one city to 94,000. Our annual report has every bit of finances that that we do as a church. One of the things we're so uh, proud of as an organization is our transparency. And so right now you can see every dollar that came in and every dollar that went out and where it went. And the reason we do it is this. I'm not going to give you a re- I'm not going to give you the excuse I don't trust the church with money. You don't want to be obedient, don't be obedient, but call it what it is. Stop blaming us for what you don't want to do. And so right now you can go online, you can see every dollar we spend and you can make the decision, do you want to be a part of it or not? <laughs> you know Settle down, Trina. You making people nervous, making me nervous. <laughs> you know, when we come uh, to the starting line of our faith, man, think back to when you gave your heart to Jesus and you came into that new relationship with Jesus. Oftentimes, that starting line, it can come with some questions, some things we don't necessarily understand out of the gate. And so over these next few weeks, I want to begin to answer some of the questions that arise when we walk this thing called faith. And here's what I want you to 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 hear, Uh, I can say that and our mind can immediately say, oh, this must be for new believers. How many know this? Sometimes the, 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 the greatest number of questions I get is in my maturity, not in my infancy. See, in my infancy, I just trust what I'm being told. In my maturity, I begin to question what I'm being told. And so it's in my maturity that I begin to ask even the deeper, the harder questions. And today I want to kick off this brand new series, The Starting Line, with a sermon that I want to title after one of those questions. And so I want to call the message today, Why Are We Here? Why are we here? What's our purpose? Why did God create me during this time, during this hour? Why, why am I existing in the world today? You ever ask yourself that question? It's one of the most basic questions of existence. Why am I here? It's one of the most fundamental questions across all faiths, across all religions, across all philosophies. There's this universal wondering of why am I here? What is the purpose of life? But how many know sometimes the pain of life makes answering that question seem impossible? And if you've ever walked through difficulty, if you've ever walked through struggle, if you've ever walked through pain, then you know how hard it is sometimes to answer the question, what is the purpose of life? Why am I here? You know, I remember um, one of the first counseling sessions that I ever walked in, like clinical counseling, 
And uh, one of the first sessions I ever had was with a family, amazing, amazing family who had just lost their daughter tragically. And, uh, and, and their daughter, she was two years old. And um, she was crazy smart, man. Like, she was just insanely smart. And um, she figured out how to unlatch the, the door in the back of her grandmother's house. And so one day her grandmother was watching her and it got towards the evening time and uh, they were just busy, you know, just doing life. And uh, the daughter, she got to up, climbed up and unlatched this door and made her way to the backyard, which was fine. But, but the problem with the backyard was there was a pool back there. And man, this sweet angel of God, she got too close uh, and fell in to that pool. And... Um, And man, by the time they got to her, it was too late. And they pulled her out and they tried to resuscitate her and and revive her. And um, she passed away on the way to the hospital. And oftentimes, like I think of that family, um, when I think of the question, like what's the purpose of life? Like how am I supposed to look those parents in the eyes and give them an answer to what's the purpose of life? Like, what's the purpose of everything that's happening? How can I find purpose in what just occurred? And man, you know how it is. We want to say, oh, you got to trust God. But, but how many know that doesn't bring peace in my pain? And I remember sitting there and for the first time, probably in my adult life, like I just felt lost. I don't know, guys. I don't know what the purpose is. And I started exploring that question a little bit deeper. And you might be here right now and maybe you don't have that type of tragedy on your life. Maybe you do. Or maybe you're in something else, a transitional season of your life. Maybe you're going through a divorce. Maybe you're going, uh, moving out of your home. Maybe you're coming into a new college or a new school or, or starting a new job or, or going through something else, caring for aging parents. Whatever the season may be that you're in, you understand this, that the pain of life and the experiences life of life can sometimes cause us to wrestle with the question, like, what's the purpose of this thing? Why am I here? And so I... I want to begin to answer that question today. And I think to answer that question, we have to go back to the starting line. And I'm talking the very first starting line. Today, if you have a Bible with you, we're going to be in the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. And we're going to start with the very first verse in the very first book of the Bible. Genesis 1. Verses 1 through 3, it says this. In the beginning, God created, say created. God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Man, what a simple statement. Like, I love the way the Bible starts, not in complexity, but in simplicity, right? In the beginning, God created everything. You ever wish, like, finding out and discovering your purpose was equally that easy? Like, it was just a verse of Scripture that just said, in your life, here's what you do, and now you got it figured out. But sometimes it doesn't feel that simple. It doesn't feel as equally plain as in the beginning, God created everything. And I think we have to understand something, though. In the very first verse of Scripture in the Bible, God does begin to give us an idea of why we are here, why we were created, what purpose we are here to fulfill. You know, in Genesis 127, it says we are created in the image and likeness of God. And so if I want to understand why I'm here, I must first understand who I was created to be like. If I want to understand my identity, the first thing I need to do is start by understanding God's identity. And when it comes to God's identity, we have to understand the Trinity. And if you're new to church, new to faith, when I say the Trinity, what that means is three people coming together to form one God. And, and like if you're new to faith, that don't make sense. That, that doesn't make sense. If you're mature in faith, that don't make sense. 
right? And so, and so let me uh, explain it a little bit. Arturio, come up here for a sec, just real quick. Yeah, 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 come on. Put your sleeves on, get in. Come on, come on. Y'all, um, I, y'all don't know this, but, but I just want to say it because I just don't get a chance to very much. Uh, man, there's a really unique call in this man's life. And, and mark my words when I say this. One day we're going to look back and we're going to see what he's accomplishing and we're going to say, there it is, right? He's going to do amazing things. Um, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. He's getting ready to preach in youth soon. Um, and, so, and so we're going to hear him do that. It's going to be incredible. All right, too much for him. All right, so, so, he, so here's our third. So, so, so when you think about him, he is a person. But, but he is created with these different distinctive characteristics that create him. And so he's made with first what? A mind. And so there's the mind of him, the processing unit of who he is that sees, that hears, that makes sense of everything that he's observing. That's the mind part. And then there's the body. Right? The housing unit of his physical existence, where his organs are. Everything physically is housed within the body. And then there's his soul. And that's where those emotions are at. Those feelings that that just cause us to react or respond without us thinking about it is born in that part of our existence. And so you got the mind, the body, and the soul coming together to do what? To form one person. And so when we think about God, it's a very similar concept. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three distinctive personalities with three distinctive purposes coming together to form one God. It's not as difficult when you think about it that way. You know, the crazy thing about God is the parts we don't understand, a lot of the times we are. And so you look at the distinctive characteristics of us, mind, body, and soul, and isn't it ironic that even we were created in a sense of a trinity. So when God says in the image and likeness, he wasn't lying. Go ahead, sit down. Give him a hand clap. And so we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three distinctive personalities coming together to form one God. And today, based on that trinity, I want us to look at three starting lines. Three starting lines that we must step up to if we want to understand and answer the question, why are we here? And the first starting line that we must step up to is the Father's starting line. The Father's starting line. Going back to Genesis 1 verse 1, it says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so scripture tells us that in the beginning, God created everything. And most Christians, they agree with this concept that God is the, is the creator of the universe, that all things begin with God. But what most people don't understand in the church is that when this was written in the 15th century, the idea that God was the creator of something was foreign. In fact, During this day and age, every other religion, every other philosophy, they assumed that matter was eternal. That matter always existed. And then out of what always existed, there were were born these different gods who would be worshipped. But the gods who were being worshipped, they were part of creation, not the cause of creation. And so in Judaism, when Jewish scripture gets released and the first book of the Bible is released to the public, the first 10 words of the Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, it shot a bullet right down the middle of culture, right down the middle of everything we thought we understood. And suddenly, the God of the universe, he was not just a manipulator of what already existed, he was the creator of it. And so when I step up to the starting line of the father, I begin to understand the first step of the father was creation. Now, why is it important to understand that? Because how many know whatever I create, I care deeply about. I care deeply about. You ever created something and like you have pride in it? Man, maybe you write music. You got confident, right? You go, you go, you're doing something. You get confident about like music you create or Maybe you create art uh, or maybe you cre- created a business and you're really proud of the business you created. Maybe you're a builder, you build a table um, or, 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 or you do some other type of crafting or maybe you're a cook 
And man, every time you cook dinner, like you have this different appreciation for what you cook. Why? Because you're the creator. So you care more about what you created than the other people around you. Sometimes it feels like, man, they're not appreciating what I've done. You ever feel that? They don't appreciate what I've done. Maybe you just appreciate it too much. (laughs) You know, I'll let you in on uh, the, the behind the scenes of my life. I'm not very handy (laughs) at all. I'm just not good at it. I'll tell you what I am good at hiring people. And so a lot of the time, you know, Danielle would be like, why are you going to pay money for that? And I'm like, because it blesses me, you and them, right? That's called a, that's called a threefold blessing. I'm just trying to disciple you a little bit deeper, right? I'm just not handy. And so when I do get handy in my house, it is a huge deal. Not to anyone else, but to me it is, right? Like I'm, I'm doing something I don't usually do. And recently, um, one of our daughters, she got a brand new bed uh, for Christmas. And so I had to do the master craftsmanship, right? I had to put this thing together. And so I start this project. I start creating that thing. And I don't know if you ever felt this, but like I started getting confident as I start, like, like all of a sudden I had this different vibe about me once I, and with every single screw that went into those pre-drilled holes, right? Like I started feeling a little bit more crafty, you know what I mean? And so I go through this thing and now I'm confident, like I'm giving directions to people. I'm asking for certain help. No, not that, that, right? And so I'm like, I'm, I'm all of a sudden super almost like cocky with this process and about a, an hour and an hour and a half passes, I finally finish it. And I'm proud, boy. I'm like calling people in. You got to see what I just did. Right? You got to go, go into, go into her room, see if you noticed anything. Right? Like I'm using those types of lines. And, 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 and so I finished this project and uh, like she would walk into the room and I would be laying on the bed and I'm like looking up at the ceiling and I'm just saying nonsense to myself. I'm, I'm just saying stuff like, you know, Jesus was a carpenter too. <laughs> you know? And I'm starting to think like, we got that in common, you know, and I'm taking pictures of it and I'm like getting ready to post it online. And do you know why? Because my fingerprints were on it and whatever my fingerprints are on, my heart is in. And therefore, if I was part of the creation, I am now embedded in that creation for forever. And someone in this church knows where I'm going. Listen, God, when he created you, He did not decide to love you or be crazy about you because of what you would accomplish. He wasn't crazy about you because of what he hoped you'd do. He wasn't crazy about you because he knew you'd never mess up. He's crazy about you. He loves you because his fingerprints are all over you. You were not created by something else and then manipulated by God. You were created by God, for God, to carry out the purpose of God. It's why scripture says, I am created in the image and likeness of God. Someone needs to receive it. God created you. God is all in on you. God is bought out on you. He is sold out on you. Why? Because when he created you, he created an extension of himself. You are an extension of the Father. Man. I always think when someone comes up to me, and, 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 you know, I, I look a lot like my dad. And they come up to me and they say, man, you look just like your father. Like in my mind, I'm like, you have no idea. You have no idea. I wish I looked like my father. Because he is always good. And so when we wrestle with the idea of why are we here? Why am I created? The first thing we must understand is you were created to be a reflection of the God who created you. You were created to be a reflection of God to the world around you, no matter where he places you. So often we'll tell ourselves, oh, I'm going to get aligned with God once I get into my calling. You're in your calling, no matter where it is. You're called to look like Christ. That's your calling. And so if he places you anywhere, if you make music, you need to make music that reflects Jesus. If you make art, you need to make art that reflects Jesus. If you run a business, run your business in a way that reflects Jesus. Your calling is to become reflective of the God who created you in anything you create. That's the first part of why you're here. 
When I step up to the Father's starting line, I learn very quickly that I'm here so that I reflect Him, not so that I glorify me. I need to reflect my Father. And so after I move past that first starting line, I come to the next one which is the Spirit's starting line. And so in verse 1, it states that God created the world. Now let's go back to verse 2. It says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. This, this verse of Scripture doesn't get enough credit for what it's really saying. You know, in Jewish culture, anytime we saw a mention of the deep being covered by darkness, what Jewish culture is saying is that's symbolizing chaos. It's a chaotic situation. And so when it says that the deep is covered by darkness, what Jewish culture is saying is that we are in a state of chaos. And it's in the state of chaos that we first meet the second member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And what's he doing? Hovering. And when we go into the original Hebrew language of that word hovering, it means that it's intentionally moving. It's intentionally vibrating. And so the very first time we meet the Holy Spirit, he's hovering above chaos and he's intentionally moving to bring peace into the darkness that's around the creation of God. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's existence its purpose is to come into our lives, to penetrate our existence in ways nobody else can, to expose pain and hurt in us that we won't show to anybody else. And then in the middle of that chaos, bring peace. This is such an incredible reflection of who the Holy Spirit is. Where there is disorder, he brings order. Where there is pain, he brings healing. Where there is sickness, he brings health. Where there is brokenness, he brings restoration. Where there is a void in your life, the Holy Spirit comes alongside you and begins to fulfill the void that you're filling with everything else in your life. Right now, there is someone sitting next to you and you could be in a relationship. I don't know who it's speaking to, but it's someone. And you are using the person you're in a relationship with to fill a void that's intended to be filled by the Holy Spirit. God did not create you dependent on someone else. God created you dependent on himself so that in your healthiness, you can lead someone else to a deeper level of discipleship. It's the Holy Spirit. And right now, you need to be honest with yourself and identify the places where there is disorder. Because if we're not careful, here's what we'll do we'll begin to justify the disorder in our life instead of deal with it. The reason I'm in this situation is because of him, because of her. The reason I'm here is because of my job. The reason I'm here is because of my boss. And I need to begin to identify the disorder in my life and then understand something that the Holy Spirit is working to bring order to your disorder. He is working to bring peace into the areas of chaos. How does he do it? By keeping you connected to the source of your peace, your father. The Holy Spirit is your connection. It builds the bridge between who you are and who God is. The Holy Spirit dwells within you and it keeps you connected to the source of your creator, your father. And, and let that sink in for a moment. Because when you understand that the Holy Spirit dwells within you and connects you to your creator, then you understand that whatever's on your mind is on God's heart. Why? Because he connects you to the heart of God. The Holy Spirit is your greatest advocate. The Holy Spirit knows what you need even when you don't know you need it. And so the Holy Spirit is constantly working on your behalf, giving what you care about, what your heart's desires are, what you care most about to the Father so that the Father can begin to create scenarios and situations that get you deeper into the purpose He has for your life. The Holy Spirit is working on behalf of you. The problem is sometimes when the times get tough, we turn away from the Holy Spirit instead of turning towards him. And in the very next chapter in the book of Genesis, we see the Holy Spirit breathe life 
into humanity. And I think sometimes we need to be reminded that the Holy Spirit's still breathing life into people today. That there could be something in your life that feels as dead as dead could get. And the Holy Spirit could come alongside you and he can begin to breathe life back into you. So many times I come across people and you know what they say? Everywhere I go, man, there's problems. Every relationship I get into is is with someone that's wrong for me. Every single place I go, there's drama. No, every single place you go, there's the Holy Spirit. And so here's what you need to do. First, comprehend that. Second, fix your mind. Third, fix your mouth. Because what you're saying isn't true. Where you go isn't, isn't followed by drama. It's led by the Holy Spirit. And so you're not walking around as a problem. You're walking around as peace. Because the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And so if the first reason I was created was to become reflective of the God who creates me, the second reason I was created is to bring peace into the chaos of this world. How? Because my presence is the Holy Spirit's presence. Why did we miss that assignment? Your presence is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. So stop telling me everywhere you go, you're followed by drama. Maybe it's time you stop worrying about what's following you and you start worrying about what's leading you. Because if you're led by the Holy Spirit, you should be trailed by the fruit of the Spirit, not by drama. What's leading you today? Are you being led by flesh or are you being led by the Spirit? Because one leads to chaos. The other leads to peace. You know, I had a conversation with someone today. And I said, man, how, how's everything going? And he said, it's, it's not good. I'm dealing with some relational things. And I'm dealing with some stuff that just, that just isn't what I want it to be. And I said, man, if you ever need to talk, let me know. And he said, yeah, I will for sure. And then the Holy Spirit like led me in this moment to say something to him. And I said, man, here's the thing. He said, I lack patience. And I said, a lot of us lack patience, but here's the thing. If the Holy Spirit dwells within you, so does the fruit of the Spirit, meaning patience is in you. So here's what the truth is. You don't lack patience. You just want control. See, a lot of the times we can allow the fruit of the Spirit to become misinterpreted in our life. And we can tell ourselves, I just don't have any patience. Do you or do you just want this situation to look the way you want it to look? Patience, you don't need to pray about it. Patience, you need to surrender it. Patience is available to everyone in this room. You just need to surrender it to God because when I surrender it to God, I no longer want to control it myself. Therefore, however it takes God, how long it takes him, I'm okay with. Why? Because I'm no longer worried about controlling it. It's the spirit working in your life. And so when I step to the spirit starting line, the reason I step to it is so that I can learn that I need to become a peacemaker in this world. So the Father's line teaches me to be reflective of God. The Spirit's line teaches me to become a peacemaker in the world. And then that leads us to the final starting line that we need to step up to. We already dealt with the Father and the Spirit. What's the third? The Son. And the third starting line I must step up to is the Son's starting line. This this wrecked me as I was preparing this message. And this is actually something that that I've probably gone through. If you've been in church for a while, you've gone through as well. But for some reason, this time around, it just hit me differently. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we encounter God the Father. In verse 2, we encounter God the Spirit. And then in verse 3, if we read between the lines, we encounter God the Son. Verse 3 says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Mm, Here's where God gets awesome. So on day one, God says, let there be light. And then in scripture, it tells us that he separates the light from the darkness. But on day four, he creates the sun and the moon. And it says that he separates day from night. And so if on day four is when what we know as light is created, what is the light that was created on day one? 
And so when you go back into the Bible and you want to begin to connect dots, you have to begin to look for consistencies. And so the second thing we begin to look for is where's another mention of the beginning of time. And when we go to John chapter one, verse one, the starting line of John's gospel, and it says this, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So now we see in the beginning was the word, the word meaning Jesus. So it's saying in the beginning was Jesus. Jesus was with God and Jesus was God. And so here John is showing us that Jesus is actually God's word manifesting in the flesh. It's God's word coming to life and carrying out the commands that God gives us here on earth. And so you can think of it this way. The father is the architect The son is the builder. The father's giving us the plans. The son is building and carrying out the father's plan. And so Jesus arrives and he starts carrying out his father's plans. He begins to build the ministry that God says he's going to be sent here to build. And in the midst of this mission, in the midst of him carrying out the commands of God, we read this as Jesus teaches a group of people In John chapter 8, verse 12. Ready? When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have light of life. Jesus says, I am what separates light from darkness. I am the light of the world. I am the light that was existent with God in the beginning. When God said, let there be light, he wasn't talking about sunlight. He was talking about his son's light. He was talking about an identity. He was talking about the glory of Jesus being manifested in this world. That we would walk in light and not in darkness. That the darkness that consumes us because of our sin would be defeated because of the righteousness of Jesus. From the very beginning, when the plans were laid, when God started creation, he had an idea. And it was this, that nothing would overcome my son. That the light that shines from the presence of Jesus would consume any bit of darkness in this world that wasn't later that was in the beginning what are we afraid of what are we scared of why are we not getting obedient to the word of God we're choosing darkness but we were created in light see A lot of the times people want to know, what do I need to change in my life? I don't need you to change. I need you to get back to who you were, who you were created to be. Let there be light. And so it's through Jesus. It's through Jesus that I become empowered to be a reflection of God. It's through Jesus that I become empowered to bring peace into the places of this world that are chaotic. And then it's through Jesus that I become empowered to walk out the very faith that I have in him by loving people the way he loves me. And so when someone says, what am I created for? What is my purpose? Why am I here? It's simple to look like Jesus. That's why you're here, to be a reflection of Jesus to be a reflection of the Trinity here is the answer to what's my purpose to reflect God in everything you create to bring peace into the chaos of the world and to love people the way Jesus loved people why are we making it more difficult you do those things and you will begin to step into the life God designed for you instead of living the life you designed you someone in this room you need to come into a new purpose because your purpose has been tied to your work your purpose has been tied to your relationship your purpose has been tied to a status that you're trying to reach your purpose has been tied to an income level your purpose has been tied to all kinds of things except the main thing which is jesus 
And you might be holding on to that purpose right now. And you might be here saying, I want to find Christ, but I'm still attached to these other things. And if that's you, I need you to hear the words of Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new has come, the old is gone. The new is here. Someone needs to have that. Someone needs to declare that on your life. The old is gone, the new is here. We must stop trying to hold on to who we were and grasp for who we want to be. I can't do it. It stretches me too thin. The old is gone. The new has come. And the same God, the same God who wrote the story of creation is ready to write your story right now. All of us in this room, every single person, not a single person overlooked or excused. Every one of us is standing at the starting line for what's next. Every single one of us. We walk out these doors and we make a decision for what we're going to do next. The real question is what are you going to allow God to create? Because you're at a starting line right now and your story's being written and we're on the first verse and the first verse of your story is in the beginning God created what? What's your story going to be? What do you need God to come into your life and begin creating? Come on, would you stand with me? Just stand to your feet for a moment. And as you stand to your feet, do me a favor and close your eyes. And I want you just to take a moment and think about this statement as we say it. In the beginning, God created. And just allow yourself to begin to envision what God's creation is for your life. Where do you need God to come into? What do you need God to recalibrate? Where do you need God to, to allow you to start over? What is it in your life that you need to surrender to God so that He can begin creating once again? Go ahead, keep your eyes closed. And we're going to pray. And then we're going to close with worship. And before we get there, I just want you to know if there's anything that you need to surrender to God, today's the day to do. And we're going to have our prayer partners come forward. And if there's anything you need prayer on, come get prayer. But most importantly, if there's something you need to surrender, surrender it at the altar. Make today the day where you say, God, I trust you with my life. And I make the declaration that I will reflect you, that I will bring peace to wherever you send me, and I will love people the way Jesus loves people. So Father, we thank you for your presence here today. We thank you for your word and for your truth. We thank you that you always know how to penetrate our hearts, how to penetrate the areas of our life that no one else sees, that you get to bring peace to those parts of our life. And maybe you're in this place today. And you're thinking to yourself, how can I bring peace if I don't have peace myself? And if that's you, I want you to know this. Your starting line is to surrender your life to Jesus. That you would stop trying to do it on your own. That you will begin to trust God with your life, with the people you love, with your friends, with your family, with your job. And if that's you right now with all eyes closed, all heads bowed. And you're saying, I, I need to start this thing for real. I need to come into a relationship with Christ. I need to give him my heart so that he can begin the transformation process in me so that I can become transformational in the world. If that's you, 
and you want to start that journey today with all eyes closed, all heads bowed on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand. I believe that God is speaking to people. I believe that the Holy Spirit is speaking to people. I believe that right now someone's feeling that Jesus is in the room and he is ready to receive you. And if that's you, then on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand. You see your hand. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead, put your hand down. Father, we thank you for every hand raised today. We thank you that you're going to meet them exactly where they are, that you're going to wrap them with your grace and with your comfort and with your peace. And I just declare right now, if anyone in this room is in this place and doesn't have peace, that they would come to you, that they would surrender to you, that they would seek your face so that you could heal their life. And if you raise your hand, we want to pray together. But here at One City, no one's ever going to pray alone. So let's all pray this prayer together. Say, dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I believe you sent your son, Jesus, to take my place on the cross, to die, to be buried, and to rise again. So my relationship with you can be restored. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Therefore, I am saved. I'm a child of God. And everyone said amen and amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord a head clap of praise. God is good. Hear me out, church. If there's something in your life that you need to surrender, do not leave this place without doing it. Amen? Now's the time. Come to the altar. Come on, let's pray.
exalt his name. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. We just thank you for your holy presence today, Father. We just bow down at the throne right now, Father God, and we surrender it all to you. We know that, Father, we are nothing without you. So at this very moment, Father, as we decrease, we know that you will increase inside of us, Father God. Today we are surrendering to you and we are praying for new beginnings, a new and fresh start in our life, Father God, that we may be more like you. So, Father God, as we submit to you today, Father God, we ask that you just stir a fire up inside of, of, of us, Father. That we seek after your word, Father, not just here in the moment, but each and every day, Father God. When times get tough, Father God, we lean on your word and not our understanding, Father. When we can't see a light, Father God, we look towards you because you are the light in all of this darkness and all of the chaos. So today, Father God, as we begin new, Father God, we rest in you. We rest in the power and authority that you have here on earth. Because we know, Father God, as of today, once we surrender it to you, we will see a change. And that is our prayer in your mighty and your powerful hands. Amen. Amen, One City. If you guys can take your seat for me. Good morning. My name is Veronica. My co-host is Lisa. And we're here to go over a couple of Connect events with you. If this is your first time visiting One City, thank you for attending the service this morning. In the seat pocket in front of you, you'll find a Connect card. If you can fill that card out for us and then at the end of service, drop it in our tiding box or either take it out to our Discover One City tent. One of our volunteers will be there to meet you and they'll give you a special gift for attending services. But the reason we ask that you complete this card for us, because for each first time guest card that we receive back, we're able to partner with the local agency and we help to provide food, shelter, and medical needs for those that are in need in our community. Another big event that's coming up here at One City is Discover One City. It's gonna take place immediately following third service today. So if this is your first time with us or if you've been here with us for six months, seven months, I ask that you join us in that event. It's a great way for you to learn about our mission, our vision, and the beliefs we have here at One City. But most importantly, you're able to see where you fit into that mission and vision. So come on out. You don't have to register or anything. We'll have you sign up. We are bringing lunch out. So come back if you can or just stay over for third service. And Lisa's going to pray over our tithes and offering. Yes, we want to thank you so much if you have partnered with us financially here at One City. Your giving means that we can do everything that we do here for children, teens, adults, whole families to come to know Jesus. And that's because of your giving. So we want to thank you for that. There are several ways to give. One is the envelopes in the seat back pockets. You can take it out, put something in there, put that in the giving box. You can text the word One City to 94,000. You can go to our website, weareonecity.com, or my personal favorite way is the Church Center app. You can download that app. That will save your information, and you can actually make it automatic, which, praise Jesus, we all need the reminder. We don't need to have to remember one more thing in our lives, right? So definitely do that, and let's go to the Lord and thank him for the gifts. Lord, we thank you so much for what you've given us. Lord, we don't deserve it. We know that everything that you give us is just because you love us and because of your grace. Thank you for the opportunity to give back just a portion of what you've given to us to further your kingdom. Lord, take the gifts that are given today, multiply them and use them in enormous ways to further your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you again for being with us. We'll see you next time.